Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Matrix Moments. This is Ayush Chamaria. And today we plan to do a deep dive of vertical social communities. Globally, we have seen a lot of communities emerge across different verticals, such as Strava for sports, Nextdoor for hyperlocal, and fandom for fan engagement. In India, with more people coming online, transacting online, a lot of offline behaviors moving online, we are seeing early signs of erstwhile niche communities becoming deep, whose needs are so specific that they require a dedicated platform to address them, something that the larger horizontals cannot do. In this session, we plan to deep dive into vertical social communities, cover potential opportunities and pitfalls into developing those communities, and for prospective founders, you know, find ways to think about how to identify the right problems, how to identify the right customers, how to think about PMF, etc. Joining me for this session are founders of two of the top most vertical social communities in India today. One, we have Mr. Prashant Sachin. He is the CEO of Apps for Bharat, also known for the app Sri Mandir. They are building the largest devotion tech platform in India. Besides that, we also have Vipul. He is the founder of Kutum. Kutum is building India's largest language community, today hosting communities of more than 10 Indian languages. Mm. I have been personally fortunate to know them for a while now. We at Matrix have been fortunate to partner with Prashant for the past year or so since their Series A. Vipul and I, in fact, go even long back. We were batchmates at our undergrad college, right? Yeah. So thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time. And with this, let's dive in. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So Prashant, maybe I'll start with you, right? <clears throat> so a big question that we hear from all the founders and hear from everyone, right? How do you really identify the problem? How do you really identify the need gap, right? Something that you did at Apps for Bharat, I mean, devotion being such a large market, but a bunch of it existing offline, so many different social media platforms catering to some needs or the other, right? Yeah. Why did you think that a vertical platform is needed? And how did you go about identifying the problem? For sure, I think I'll give you a bit of a background um, for you to be able to understand why we went about this particular problem statement. Now, I've been observing uh, the India story play out for a decade now, ever since I was in college. Now, <clears throat> we would realize that everything has moved online. Uh, from your wallets, to you playing cricket in your gully, to now playing cricket on a phone. And almost every behavior has moved online. And I, and I was uh, enamored by how this phone has become a very important space in people's life. Now, uh, prior to Apps Bharat, I was building another company and I was um, always thinking about what is it that is large enough behavior and hasn't really moved online yet. Mm -hmm. Now, I come from um, a family of farmers from Kanpur and um, this is one behavior which is uh, the devotion needs and how people fulfill them. Um, as a very, very important behavior or practices that are at the core of at, at the core of people's life, and this was something that was always at the back of my mind. And while building my previous company, I while I was building that, I kept on thinking about is there something, mm. um, and like an entrepreneur does, right? I was thinking about what is it that the users might need, which is still not there, and. Um, over the course of many interactions, I started thinking seriously about um, devotion should also move online. Um, now, many other learnings happened in the past where I started thinking more deeply about the space. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the learnings was um, I realized about myself that I'm somebody who uh, likes building for uh, engagement driven platforms. Uh, now, I think of any platform in two ways. <coughs> one is where transaction is the core action and another one is where engagement is the core action where everything else follows. And I started thinking about um, when it comes to any of these engagement first platforms what the key levers are. And I realized any legendary company in engagement first space had these three important levers, which is they were able to crack very high quality retention. They were having a very high frequency use case and there was a strong habit formation. So then I put this lens and started mm -hmm. thinking about if devotion were to move online, what is it that should be done? And then we ran a few experiments and one of the ideas that stood out was this. So for us, we identified that this behavior should move online and then we had a methodical approach to understand what is that one hook or two hooks that we should build for 
and that's how the journey started so one was this personal bias mm. to this observation of behaviors moving online through this methodical approach where we saw that hey let's try something and that's how we were able to do what we are trying to do excellent very good moving on to you vipul i know since the day you started the first question or the only question that everybody asked you starting from investors to operators was communities exist on facebook groups communities exist on whatsapp communities exist on telegram why are you building a new platform and what is even the need for it Yep. So I'll, I'll take this story a little back. Uh, so um, I think all four of us co-founders, we were working at a, a company called Pratilipi prior to this, right? So we were in the consumer internet space per se, and more importantly, also very much familiar with the uh, tier two, tier three user persona that we are solving for, right? So that's really was that was really the genesis of you know solving for this particular persona and having a comfort in the space that's where we wanted to sort of start up so that was the first thing that we started with uh, besides that i think the general idea of starting up was on our minds uh, since since long and what we were doing is we were uh, essentially uh, testing out a lot of ideas right it wasn't very thesis driven to start with <laughs> uh, it was more about you know just talking to users trying to understand what do they do in in their day to day life and Uh, finding out white spaces uh, within that so it was uh, just one of these ideas that we were researching upon and uh, talking to a couple of users and at the end of it we would generally ask our users uh, that that you know we are a team of software developers and <laughs> uh, what else we can uh, help you with so this this particular thing sort of uh, popped up couple of times that you know hey can you make an app for my community right so that 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 uh, got us uh, all 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 struck right as to the question that you had that these uh, platforms already exist why why is this person asking for a separate app for their community so that that got got us very curious and then uh, back of the mind obviously coming from tier 2 to tier 3 background ourselves we had a very good understanding of how community as a concept is very much deep rooted into uh, the indian society more so in tier 2 to tier 3 right so Uh, given all of that context we started to delve more deep into it uh, trying to understand why are the existing platforms not able to solve the problems that these people are actually looking to solve for themselves and that's where it all started now coming back to your question uh, original question which is about why were these platforms actually not being able to solve some of these problems so i think uh, it all boils down to being very very specific to the needs of these particular communities right so most of the communities when we started were offline communities that had a very different offline behavior to start with and as a method of ease to get online what they wanted was that those behaviors should ideally be replicated onto something mm. that they want to uh, get started online to right so existing platforms be it let's say whatsapp groups facebook groups telegram and so on they were very very generic in nature and were not able to replicate those behaviors online mm. just to give you an example uh, i uh, some of these people have have a very organized community wherein you know they have a set of uh, uh, members in the community who who hold different positions within the community now this um, as as a concept they would want to show it up uh, so assume that to uh, assume that they were to develop a website of their own they would put these names on the contact us page or on the team page of their website right so that is something that they wanted that the app should also be able to do for them yeah. uh, this is just one of the many examples but it's essentially getting deeper into the specific needs of the particular communities that we were working with in the initial set and being able to solve very very deeply for them i think i think that's that's where it all started very interesting so if i were to just summarize the overarching theme here is that a lot of behaviors that are currently existing offline have to move online or yeah. wanted to move online and both of you played on that thread that okay while there are different platforms that are probably catering to this in some form or the other there is no one dedicated platform that is bringing the entire thing onto that platform yeah. right yeah. you or this very i think good. i think one interesting point here that people also mentioned was this that existing platforms were not catering to that specific need in a in, in a well rounded way mm. so for example in our case the devotion is already people go to a youtube or a facebook group or a whatsapp group to do this but think about this right if you go to a youtube and you are in this frame of mind that hey i have to now listen to um, let's say sam chalisa or bhajan and in between there is ad mm. so for some of these behaviors you need this designated space to conduct those practices yeah and hence the need of a new platform which gives you that space where you walk in and you connect in a certain way yeah 
yeah mm, oh interesting okay so having identified the idea having identified that okay there is a need for a vertical community let us build that how did you go about identifying the first set of customers right i mean you knew that okay we need to move devotion online we need to build communities how did you identify your first 100 users okay these are the set of users that i want to target and how did you really target them how did you really reach them what was like the pitch that worked the best for both of you i mean either of you if you want to take it yep so sure. i'll take that so i think um, before even reaching out to the first set of customers to sort of <coughs> onboard them to the platform uh, the first step much much before that was actually talking to these users to actually understand their pain right so that that's where it actually starts where you start also recruiting some of those customers while you are talking to them to identify the needs very deeply trying to understand what are some of the alternatives that they have used to fulfill those needs and so on while while doing all of that uh, you are in 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 a way also recruiting those as as your early customers right so that that's really what we did uh, and for us the problem was twofold because community as as a um, uh, medium has to have two sided uh, users right users who are consuming the content in the community or engaging in the community and there are admins or moderators who are running those community so we started with the user side of it as to uh, why and how they feel uh, the platform should be and we were talking to uh, a lot of people on the user side but uh, to to your question right uh, how to recruit those early users is just by uh, you know talking to users for the research and then then you know there will be a core set who who you would feel is very very excited about the idea and the pain for them is much more uh, deep rooted right those are probably the a uh, good set of early customers that you should uh, engage with more and then have them uh, try out your product very early on yeah. got it and in this prashant maybe if you can take this how broad or how narrow should a founder be right i mean if we see historically the growth of facebook for example right started in a small dorm room in harvard so focused on a very small niche of customers so whatever they call it pmf or whatever there and then they expanded right so as founders how broad or how narrow should one think of their initial customer set yeah yeah I think it will depend on what are you solving for. So I'll tell you <coughs> how exactly we approached it. So we said that this time we'll not bring in our biases in, and we would look at all the existing offline behaviors, run a few experiments, and see what can be translated as it is online. And we said this time we'll not create a new behavior, and we'll see what people do in the offline world. Can there be a parallel? Mm. So the first thing we did was we launched a few apps. Um, which essentially were some of those behaviors i'll talk about those behaviors now so let's say one behavior is that people would want want to uh, read a panchang every single morning another one would be let's say think of um i am someone who reads a re- lot of literature mm. um or there's another user who would want to listen to something and so on um and the behavior in in our case that we identified was uh, there's a shrine everywhere at every single household Uh, at a shop in every single car dashboard and what not now there's a virtual space can we move a shrine there and what not these are four ideas that we started fiddling with and we said this time um we would separate the two processes and those two processes are one is product building and product marketing hmm. so we said we would product build and would say if um there's a mass appeal to it what we'll do is we'll launch these apps put a banner ad or put a ad on facebook and see who all resonate with it so that will essentially do a selection of the people who will resonate with the idea mm-hmm. and see how when they come to the app how do they behave on that so for us it was in this case was we launched these four apps one after another and what we did was we ran simple ads and we said let's just by data understand what do these people need so the first uh, set of feedback that we got was through data where we saw how is their um, initial journey what they're liking what they're not liking what we in parallel did we i started identifying the people who are liking the product and who are not liking the product and we started calling them so right. the first set of sampling was done by running these ads get those users in see the extreme product lovers and people who don't love it and call both of them hmm. and this is how we ran the whole process now what we did was we put 2000 rupees per day as a spend and we got these 500 2000 users every single day and saw how they're using the product and in this case um we did not go to specific people and call them up first primarily because when you speak to them when you approach them um uh, they might be a bias because you have reached out to them and told them that hey use our product we're building this we said let's just uh, build on this this thesis and see if it works 
and I would say this reverse approach that we tried this time mm -hmm. sort of worked for us. Instead of going to the users first, we said, let's just put the product in the market and see the adoption and then iterate. So that's how we approached this time. Got it. And this initial set of users that you reached out to, right, spending 2000 and this, where did you actually find them? Did you discover them from some of the existing groups or how did you target them? No, we just ran simple fa uh, Facebook ads. For example, the ad said that, hey, uh, set up a temple of Hanmanji on your phone. Mm. That's, this is one ad. The other one is uh, access Gita on your phone. Mm. Um, then read daily panchang on your phone. So <coughs> we were running these set of ads and see who were onboarding and there was simple two pager apps, three pager apps and so on. So this is how we, uh, so it was like we said that, think about this right, you open a shop in Indranagar, you put a large banner saying um, pet shop mm. and see who all would come who in. Who all would come in. Yeah. Got it. Oh, very interesting. Got it. So having identified the idea, identified the customers, onboarded some of the customers, right? Then probably starts your zero to one journey. Yeah. How did you think about doing that, right? During the entire course of the zero to one journey, how did you think about the different variables, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of how do we build the team? What should be the ideal marketing spend, ideal burn? What should be your different variables, right? What are the key metrics that we should focus on? Which, which are the key metrics that would, you know, make you sit and notice, okay, aha, this is working, yeah. right? So how did you approach that? Yeah. So I think this time when we were building this company, right, this was born out of this experiment pod um, in my previous startup. So um, we had limited resources. So we had uh, one PM, one data guy who was an intern and a couple of devs and one intern designer. So we had these many resources and we have to play within that. Mm. Um, so we said, uh, and we had some marketing spend. So, so we had these limited things that, that they, were, they were only these people that we can work with. Then there was this daily spend of 2000 rupees per day. Uh, so the natural instinct was to that, that we should focus on the matrices and what is important to it. So our focus entirely was on this part. Let's build the product. Mm. Like I said, right, it was an engagement first app business. So we said three things have to hold true. One is uh, if it is not a high frequency use case, it's not going to work. Second one was we said uh, in, at least the initial attention has to be good. Mm. Um, and let's not worry about long-term retention and we'll solve long-term retention. And the third part is what we said, he, this, this particular behavior already exists in the offline world. It's a strong habit. Do we have some signs of uh, habit formation habit here? Formation here. Okay. So this is how we started approaching it. Now the point is, um, out of the first few experiments that we ran, we very clearly looked at that, oh, how is the D1? Primarily D1 is an indicator of, D1 retention is an indicator of whether the, there's a natural recall that is built in the product or not. So then we looked at uh, the first four or five days of usage. Then we looked at recall. Mm. So the people who were using it, we called them up and asked them uh, what, is their, what was their feeling when they used the app. And accordingly, we uh, decided which one, which app to pursue. Now, my bias was that some other app should work that we tried. But to our fortune, the app that clearly stood out was this app. Mm. Uh, which is called Shreemandir today. Um, now, we got all of these things right and then um, we kept on iterating on it. So, the people who were the top quartile performers, we kept on asking them that, hey, uh, what else should we add? What else should we add? And we kept kept on aggregating everything in the app and that's how we iterated. So, the first six, seven months of the journey was just this process mm. where we, with this team and this marketing spent, we kept on iterating and day on day, week on week, we kept on improving our retention numbers we identified the top quartile and looked at w in, in a given week how many of them are using the app on every single day and whatnot. So this is what our metric was. And we just kept on chasing it. Mm. And, and this seven month of focus, eight month of focus gave us very, very good answer on what this might be. Vipul right. mm. Singh. Yep. So uh, for us, I think early on, uh, again, there were um, obviously we didn't have multiple ideas to start with. We were focusing on just one. But within that, uh, there were the problem was two sided, right? Uh, as, as I told earlier, um, in, in community, you have to solve for the people who are running those communities. And then there are people who are joining and engaging with the community, right? So first, we had to decide as to which one to solve for first, right? So our natural instinct on that was that, uh, and then it was uh, slightly strategic as well, is that uh, for uh, you to be able to solve for the admins who are basically running uh, these communities in some shape and form offline and on other platforms as well, uh, the shift uh, that they have to do, the uh, friction there is much higher, right? 
versus for for the user end user who is consuming uh, the content in the community who is engaging with the community uh, the initial friction is much lower right and so 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 we thought we will we'll, uh, solve the uh, user side of it first and once we have uh, uh, solved on the user side it's actually much easier to solve on the admin side as well because mm. now you have users to give to those mm. admins right so we started with the user side and we focused on just one community so kutum initially was just an app for a single community it wasn't wow. a platform oh. per se right we started with uh, a teachers community in rajasthan so that's uh, where we started to build right we put out ads on facebook saying hey this is an app for teacher in rajasthan only if you are a teacher in rajasthan you can come and join this app yes. so once the users come in i think uh, some of the things that uh, prashant already mentioned we were very very focused on um leading indicators be it in terms of you know how and do the users have recall on the app how does the initial d1 d7 look looks like uh, are people actually engaging uh, on the app or not um, are they they've been spending some few minutes of their time on the product on day one or not right so uh, initial focus was just to solve for this one particular persona keeping in two three pillars as as prashant mentioned very much uh, similar Uh, uh pillars that we were building on retention was the key focus uh, habit building uh, again we were looking at it from a long term perspective as long as uh, uh, you have the app installed in your phone and uh, you're opening it even let's say after a couple of months mm-hmm. even though your frequency is lower we were fine with it to start with the reason being the use case that we were solving for in itself was not a daily use case at least yeah. very very initially we obviously wanted it was a good thing to have but not a necessity for us but beyond that i think retention was super important and just being able to iterate uh, uh, to solve for retention was the key focus so the process there was to you know talk to users on a daily basis trying to understand what's working for them and what's not working for them and the idea there was to focus more on what's working and doubling down on that yeah. and you know um, um, filling uh, giving more more of those features working on those features iterating very very quickly right so uh, to give you an example i think in the first 180 days uh, first was 6 months or so which ship shipped uh, about 120 times on on uh, app store wow, wow. right so uh, you know 1 apk per per wow. 1.5 days is what wow. we did so that that's the real focus that we had you know just get insights on a daily basis like we will put out a release uh, midnight next day we will wake up we have some users we'll call them up right away trying to understand what what they're feeling about the product next day we are on to something new right yep. just just iterating on on that so that's really what uh, worked for us uh, at least <coughs> in the first 6 months or so next phase obviously was to then solve for admins uh, and on the admin side once we had solved for the user side wherein we were, you know we were seeing uh, a good amount of retention people were inviting other people in on the product and so on Uh, the value proposition on admin side become became uh, much clearer uh, you know uh, the value proposition was very simple that hey you bring your community here and will will bring you the users or rather those user, users will come on their own and, and and engage and as an admin why would i not want that right so that became clear and uh, then we started to uh, iterate on the admin side of things took a couple of months there as well Uh, one specific instance that happened uh, after a couple of iterations on the admin side is that one fine day we had uh, one admin that we had onboarded very recently and that particular community from that admin uh, just went viral and uh, got us about 50000 downloads in wow. a day right wow. <laughs> and that was our you know sort of eureka moment wherein we said hey there is this is something that we are definitely working, going to yeah. and yeah we should double down triple down on just this lovely wow wow so broadly what i hear is two things in the 0 to 1 phase one stay absolutely close to your customers mm. keep on hearing to what your customer says because that is probably the best form of feedback that you're going to get and then iterate improve the app yeah. with that and second a lot of early founders face this conundrum should we chase growth versus retention at least in the early phase but what i hear from you guys i think just chasing retention and ensuring that retention is sorted so that it does not really become a leaky bucket is really the key right yep got it okay next i think all the founders struggle with this magic word or the magic uh, phase called product market fit right so i mean coming from both of you how did you guys think about it when did you guys really think that okay we have probably achieved an early product market fit right 
be it in terms of matrices, be it in terms of probably for you, the virality of 50,000 users gave you a early thing that, okay, have we found product market fit or this is a product market fit, right? So how did you guys think about product market fit that, okay, once this is done, we think we have achieved product market fit and how does a founder iterate towards getting up to product market fit really? Um, so again, uh, as I told previously, right, so for us, uh, product market fit meant, I think, two things majorly. One, we should uh, have at least some set of users um, for whom we are solving very, very deeply, right, and in terms of matrices that would reflect into <coughs> the retention, that will reflect into the uh, engagements and so on, right. Second was having some scalable channel to actually reach out to more of such users. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if you can <coughs> develop a product, but then you don't know how to reach out to those users, you're still stuck. So I think these two things uh, is, is what we were solving for. And uh, the idea there was, again, uh, to, to iterate uh, very, very quickly, um, basis the feedback that we were getting from the customers. Um, obviously, looking at what else is happening outside uh, on, on other platforms, how some of the um, bigger companies have in their initial days uh, approached the problem and so on helps. But uh, essentially, if you were to point it out to just one thing that, that really worked and helped is staying close to the customer and mm -hmm. iterating very quickly on the feedback that you get from those customers day in and day out. Yeah. I think for us, um, how we actually approached this was, was in phases. Mm. The first phase was we said that if we have crazy good user love in the first three, four months where people are able to, they're enamored by what you've created. Mm. Um, that's the first phase, a super early phase, sort of a indicator to PMF. Got it. So the first four, five months, we were just looking at anyone who's installing the app, what is it that they're saying? And um, there's a practice that we follow um, in our company where we actually write down the thesis beforehand and we say that, hey, if the user says some of these things, we are in good place. Mm. Now, the magic that happened was that many of these users came back and they said such good things about the product mm. where I've been trying to build apps over the last eight, nine years of my life now. And I have not seen, so so user love is there, people say this is a good app, but when, when they give you gratitude for what you have built, there's a profound happiness. They're thankful to what you have built. Mm. We said there is something which is clicking here. So that that user love was very, very deep. So uh, there were reviews where people talked about them having negative thoughts, that receding, them feeling more stronger mm. and whatnot. And, and we realized that this is true to what devotion is in the current form. It gives you that fabric of hope yeah. that you tie closer to your body and you feel more stronger and whatnot in your good days, bad days and whatnot. So we said, we have not seen this kind of feedback if this feedback is coming our way, there's something in this. So that was mm. a phase one of identifying that there is something in the product. Okay. Phase two was where we said that, that hey, there is some retention benchmark in their head, in their head when, when having spent some time in the, in this kind of game, I, we understand that, oh, what is a good D1, D7, D30 and whatnot. We said, let's have a very objective approach and see, do all users that you onboard with that banner that you mm. show them, what is the kind of behavior they're showing them. So we actually followed a reverse approach where we said that we'll not segment users and say, this percentage of users are loving the product. We'll not say that. We'll say all the users that we acquire are showing this kind of retention. So we kept on optimizing on that. And when we started seeing uh, the numbers Im improving and getting to those benchmarks, we said the early stage retention is solved. Mm. And the third phase was when we said, do we have signs of habit formation? So we look at these LNS curves. So when we look at seven day LNS curve and 30 day LNS curve, there was a significant portion of people. Mm. Um, so for example, in our um, L7 by seven, around 16% of the weekly active users were using the app on all days of the week. Mm -hmm. And around 10% of the monthly active users, 10% of L30 by 30 was a number when they were using the app on all days of the month. month. And you're like, this indicates that we're on the right path. And then we kept on iterating. So basically we had these, defined these three phases. The first one was early user love, second was early retention. And the third one is where we said that, do some people showcase that mad behavior. Mm. 
and in all of this process we said uh, we'll always solve for demand now what i mean by that is we said um, if the end game for us is 100 million people using it every single day we should see if a segment of them come to our, come to your app today and are their needs met so we kept on focusing on that instead of everything else we said that if if you have to <coughs> scrape some content and put it on the platform and see if people would use it do that so mm-hmm. whatever you need to do on the supply side it's your problem the demand side should be sorted so that's how we approached and for the same reason we focused on creating a single player game or single player usage on the app and not multiplayer usage because we understand that multiplayer usage would would need many many variables to solve so we said ki let's just minimize our variables and kept on focusing on them and if you have signs of a very strong single player usage there are means in which you can take it to multiplayer and what not so this is mm-hmm. how we approached it so the first one year looked like this very interesting so i see this lns curve as one common thread connecting you both right because if yep. i remember correctly even when kutum started early in the days there was a very strong focus on lns curves right yep. and yep. Yep. for those uh, uh, for the others who are hearing for the for the first time lns basically means an l5 by l7 means out of 7 days in a week how many use it for 5 days so similarly for l4 means 4 days mm-hmm. out of 7 days right yeah very interesting so one one profound thing prashant just mentioned right which is solving for the demand itself right so uh, for us uh, as well there was uh, several instances wherein uh, you know uh, you you get some sort some feedback from some of your users which you never expected you which is out of your thesis but uh, once once the user asks yes. for it you mm. know you know you, you know. have to build it, to right? it yeah. and it does not matter whether it was on your plan or not whether <laughs> whether um, that's um, on on the supply side you have it or not and what not right so i think just focusing on what the users are asking and uh, i mean uh, at that at times even uh, uh, you you felt like uh, users are pulling the product out of you mm. right and that that's where you know brilliant the, point yeah brilliant uh, point uh, early pmf is is what you have i think one thing which is which is what people said is what i totally concur with is um you know you are not creating it for you correct so your job is to build for an audience and you should not be extremely particular about <laughs> what your biases are yeah. so um hard learnings but in the first one year whatever feature that i was very biased to ki ye to work karna chahiye work karna chahiye wo nahi work kiya <laughs> <laughs> and i was like ki, uh. and i i was like ki, and that's when i and this is still my office you know um where i um, have written keep your biases at home when you enter this office mm. uh, so and this is note to myself where we as creators have this strong creator complex we say that ye to aisa hi hona chahiye but audience totally amazes you yeah and our job is to build for them whatever it takes no oh, correct so as we call it being as outside in as possible right yeah. i mean that is the approach that really helps for this stage right for 0 to 1 by the time you are approaching early pmf how should founders really think about team building because that is again one question that who should be my first hire should we focus more on product should we focus more on engineering generating demand generating supply how do you guys think about it early team building yeah so i think the first thing to <coughs> uh, uh, look on on that is that uh, you hire for uh, things that you don't have within your founding team right so in terms of skill set that's what mm-hmm. obviously is is what you should look for <coughs> but beyond that i think uh, the mm, focus was a lot more on hiring generalists uh, than than you know people in a very very specific skill set um, and and uh, i mean uh, beyond just um, the surface of of the world culture there there is a lot of uh, i think nuances a lot of context around the kind of culture the kind of product the kind of, kind of team that you in yourselves are right so i mean hiring early team members in that sense is like a you know arranged marriage where <laughs> you know there is a lot of context around which uh, you cannot even put on paper right so that that's really what it is so a lot of focus just on who the right people for you as a team and uh, for for your context in the industry and stage are right that's very important but beyond that i think hiring for skill sets that you yourself don't have mm-hmm. is obviously something that you should fo- you should focus on and then hiring hiring more uh generalists rather than you know specific ones uh, focusing on specific skill set 
is something that we focused on and uh, that has worked brill brilliantly for us wherein you know even if uh, that person didn't have that skill set but they were able to you know uh, on on first principle basis pick up pick up that problem and actually solve solve it for us so that has really really worked and we've been on the other side wherein we've hired for specific mm. skill sets in the early days <coughs> that has um, sadly doesn't had hasn't worked for us so far yeah. interesting uh, we had a different i mean i think this is <coughs> this is where it becomes interesting right which is we had a slightly different approach to this where the f the first set of people that i wanted to hire was in finance <laughs> where <Okay. laughs> where i said that uh, when it comes to company building and there's a lot of reading that i've done so i feel companies evolve today we are building a company which is building internet products but the first layer second layer of the company remains the same one is hr second is finance mm. so i said everything else will change <laughs> get a very good finance person uh, who can do everything around company building for you because that's what my core skill set is so that's one hire that we did in the first 2 3 months a very good hire that we did in the first 2 3 months um, then beyond that we said that we know what we would want to build but we would want to take a very very data backed approach mm. to be able to build this so we did not hire generalist in this case okay for the first one year um we hired ex specialists so for example um people with data chops pms with data chops and so on so the idea was um whoever you are building you have to give them very very specific areas to to keep to go deep into because we had some strong indicators and we said for this year if we are able to crack this much mm -hmm. we'll be in good place so we actually identified the pain areas and we kept people with um with deep focus on on those and we said and what we told them was understand the indicators and keep drilling down so that's the kind of team we had in the first place now once we were able to get there that's when we got the generalists Generalism. in the team so we said that the first year would be more about uh chasing data and then once you understand where this would go to then you add these generalists who do further problem solving Mm. so that's how we approached and uh, i think um, in a way it has worked fine for us uh, where uh, we and this this thing primarily why we did was was because we said um, because it's such a relatable area everybody would come with their ideas that yeah. let's do this let's <laughs> do this let's do this yeah. and also when we talk to like lot of people in the market they'll always say ki uh, put this <laughs> this will work put this this will work yeah. and we said that will not listen to any one of them we have a, a playground to play on we'll see what people will act on and we'll keep on going in deeper uh so that's the approach we followed this time got it so net net there's no one size fits all approach yeah. but the founders need to be cognizant on what works best for the company yeah. and then go ahead with i think one more team like. that we hired was the ux research team mm. so one was this whole the other one was so <coughs> we separated these two functions where we said that this team's job is to do calling and and i'm also let's say i go on these calls and spend time every single day there's a mark in my calendar where i do mm. this so that's one set and there's another set so we pass on information from here to here but we we somehow have kept them uh in parallel rather than uh intermingling and what not so there's a ux team which comes and brings insights and there's a team whose job is to uh keep optimizing and this job their job is to understand what is going right and what is going wrong uh thematically Right. Very interesting. Okay, so having discussed PMF, what uh, Avnish really calls it three stages of building a business, right? One there's early PMF, second there's scalable PMF, and third there's scalable profitable PMF. Right? <laughs> so having got a taste of early PMF, okay, this is what early PMF means. Once you start scaling, right, or as you start chasing scalable PMF, does the approach, does the way you look at the business, does the metrics that you look at, do the team that you look at change? And if yes, how does that approach really change? and you want to take that yeah i'll take that <laughs> so um i think uh, um the core functions remain the same so we have this uh, the whole org is in form of pods and every pod has very clear goals now i feel those pods remain the same you might add a growth pod and you might add a monetization pod and what not with time but the core of the business essentially is the same so um so we see it as um 
series of um, uh, concentric circles for that matter so the core remains same which is you have these four or five pods which are focusing on primarily engagement retention initial usage initial adoption and what not and then let's say uh, and we understand that the business will not work if this core fails yeah. so that's where we feel um, you have to focus keep focusing and what has happened historically is also as companies scale as they get more users this core often breaks so breaks. so mm. especially in companies like like ours like the engagement first games and what not so we have kept the core intact and there'll be like there's a crazy focus that we constantly keep it rating and said ki this should never break and this has to keep improving and we have kept our par sai and and so on we are working on that and then as the business scales for example uh, in the first phase we said we will not focus on product marketing we'll just focus on uh, product building mm. so till um, january we had one marketer and now we have built a social media marketing team this team that team and what not so essentially we are now building more modules on the second circle and similarly let's say we have started some experiments on understanding the propensity to pay and what would people like to pay on without breaking their trust and what not so this is another part that we have built so this is how we see the org or right. i'll come back to this monetization point given everybody struggles with this but uh, yeah, yeah. Have to so as as prashant mentioned right the core of the company obviously is is something that is there to remain so first uh, being very deeply focused on that and then over time uh, just making sure that that the core remains and um, uh, nourishes over time right that's that's something that you have to definitely focus on so for us uh, i mean the product itself uh, grew quite a lot um, uh, in terms of the a number of things that were there in the product right so what happened is that maintaining that core uh, being able yeah. to maintain not just build that mm. core also became very very important so mm. i think we had to put in a good amount of effort uh, you know building um, analytics building reportings uh, weekly daily reportings and so on um, uh, if if something breaks uh, uh, you should have somebody who is responsible to to look <laughs> at it and so on right so uh, just being able to maintain that core beyond just building it out yeah. right so that's that's one thing that we had to focus on uh, in in uh, some of the later days right and then secondly as as prashant also mentioned right uh, now given that the, that core is out there now you are building uh, circles around it right mm. uh, in terms of the fo- more thi- on, in terms of number of things that you want to focus more on right so he mentioned growth uh, similarly uh, it could be monetization again something that he mentioned um, now that uh, there are more people in the team you might also have want to have a dedicated hr team who you know uh-huh. make sure that the people are comfortable uh, uh, in in the office <coughs> environment and what not right so uh, again uh, to to put it uh, in in a few words right so for the founders the core will remain the same your focus will remain the same but you will keep adding things to it but you have to make sure that you know you know uh, uh, the initial focus uh, or, or where the um, real business l- lies for you is is something that you have to take uh, into consideration all the time yeah. very interesting so like i said just coming back to that monetization point right <laughs> i mean i think all the founders building in the social space struggle with this in in terms of when is the right time to actually go ahead and run monetization experiments when is the right time to do it right so i know both of you are now doing it in some form or the other so i would love to hear how you guys approached it how do you think you know when is it the right time to think about monetization per se and how should founders prospective founders really go about it yeah i'll take this um, so i think um before monetization you have to think of user journey and um when you can so for example in a user journey you you have to imagine a optimum flow of users in the app them using over a certain period of time and what not if your monetization complements it then it's the right time to monetize mm-hmm. if it doesn't then it's early mm. now when i look at monetization i see that hey there's a user who's coming on the app he's using it certain in certain way if the core usage is fulfilled and if monetization that you put as a service or whatever you're putting right is adding to that that usage is is the right time to think about monetization so so you have to think of it as is monetization adding to experience mm. or is it depleting his experience yeah. on the app so for us uh, we realized in single player mode or when we have launched multiplayer mode also where it come teas and what product we put together on the app we see that there's a there's a beautiful a uh, journey that is there on the app and we realize that can we create an additional flow 
which is which will not obstruct the earlier flows but it complements some of those flows or is a add on to that particular flow without breaking the user trust user love if this all adds up mm. try monetizing got it so for us we realized that and of course calling our users really really help <laughs> so uh, we were not thinking of monetizing all of this while um, however some of the users called us and said that hey uh, can you do this for us where they said uh, we trust you for this this thing outside is totally broken mm. can you do this for us and when that feedback became repetitive and there was a pattern we said let's see what could be done here and accordingly we said that now let's see if people will adopt and and so on so that's how we thought about monetization we said they asked for something and we said let's just see if we can offer it yeah without breaking the user love and user trust love and trust so we said let's just put it together and see whether it makes sense so that's how we started and we, it's we are still very very early but uh, for us that monetization essentially doesn't break their user journey it complements it beautifully right i think i think just to add to that uh, the user journey piece of it right so uh, if you think of youtube as an as an example a super chat is something that came in very very recently right youtube has been there for long uh, so um, the idea there i i feel is that um, um, uh, for for something like super chat to work uh, the connection between uh, you know somebody who's running that channel and somebody who's paying for that mm. super chat has to be very very deep yeah. and it'll take its own course of time um, uh, to to actually build that uh, equation in the first place right so it has to basically you have to basically start with the assumptions uh, as to you know these are the things that are stopping me from monetizing as of today yeah and then you have to clear them out and you have to be honest Uh, on on whether those those are the fair assumptions to have yeah. these are the real problems before we 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 can actually monetize and once you are at that stage wherein you those those assumptions no longer hold true that that's right time to you know look at monetization yeah yeah i think uh, there's also one thing that we often miss out is um what's the theme of the platform mm. what that space that you have created virtually what it makes the user feel for example in our case um if a user is coming into the app you want to you want him to have a certain um certain frame of mind when mm-hmm. he enters the space yeah now for us something like ads will not work at all correct because the reason why you started was because you would want them to have a specific space where they would enjoy have the joy and what not so for us something like ads would not work so we are we have to think of services which will complement their existing mm. um uh space creation for them where they would feel nice and happy and what not so so basically you know one thing which is also very very important for us when we started doing it we said that hey there are many ways to monetize a platform like this what fits your theme and what doesn't so have a very st- we we try to build this very strong thesis of what we would not do or what we would never do yeah yeah so that's that's that actually made our life easier where we knew that we would not we would we would never do ads mm <laughs> so he said now uh, how do you build a business and that's how the <laughs> that's how the the whole iteration process started mm, mm, right so net net again don't rush into monetization stay close to your customers probably the best time is when the need for monetization comes from customers themselves right that okay this is one feature that i want and then you realize okay let me introduce and key thing to keep in mind is that like you said prashant it complements the user journey and does not you know make him lose the trust on the platform or you know mar his experience in some way or yes. the other yes yes right. absolutely got it very interesting okay so final question from my side right i mean either of you can take this if you were to start up again right be it, could be across any spaces i mean be it media social gaming or any of the broad spectrum of spaces there right which one would be where do you see one white space where a large company can get created again and If you were to start up again, what would you do differently than what probably you have done in this journey, or Prashant, you have done in your earlier journeys as well? <laughs> okay, I'll take this. So one is uh, uh, my company's name is First Principle Apps for Bharat. Correct. And the app is called Free <laughs> Mandir. So I'll I'll still do that, which is I'll build First Principle Apps for Bharat, hmm. but for a may, maybe for a different problem statement. So there, so coming uh, from my hometown, I've seen a lot of these problems that people have. i would pick some of them which i feel are large enough uh, mm. would still doing that because i feel um 
people these people deserve better solutions whatever their problems are so i would still go ahead and if not devotion would would solve for any other problem that this audience would have um and it comes to let's say what i'm what i would do differently i would like to believe that i'm doing it right this time <laughs> uh i'm i'm being very mindful with respect to and the good part is every startup is like a university it's a mm. crash course that you do in a few years of so you do multiple programs in just one journey that you build so i'm very thankful to my previous company for so many learnings that 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 i've had um so i'm just uh, some of them were direct experience some of them them were learnings from my fellow founders where they told this is what worked what did not mm. work i'm just trying to balance uh, all of that in this company and um, have certain principles on which i am abiding by so i hope i'll do it right this time. <laughs> got it vipul yep so i think uh, in terms of you know the spaces that uh, feel interesting again obviously i i still hope that i get to build what i'm building for a long long time to come right so but beyond that i mean one of the spaces that i've been recently uh, looking at is uh, gaming for kids right so mm-hmm. uh, uh, what has happened uh, over past couple of years is that uh, smartphone adoption obviously has uh, gone up uh, quite heavily and what happens uh, uh, at that at back back at my home is that i i see a lot of kids hopping onto those smartphones right at at a very early age and gaming um, is is obviously in by by its nature is very addictive uh, and especially to the kids in yeah. their primitive years so uh, building you know content and games for kids in in their early years which are actually uh, mindful of uh, the long term repercussions uh, on on their psyche on their uh, overall development and what not i think that's that's one area that i would definitely want to look at and most recently if you see um, uh, across different countries uh, in the us in the uk even in china some of the regulations have have also you know uh, geared into this directions wherein they've mm. uh, uh, limited the kind of content the kind of apps that you can serve to kids um, and then the amount of time that you can uh, show it yeah. to them and so on right so that that's bound to happen even uh, in in india so i think that that's one area definitely i would want to look into very interesting three pieces of advice that you would want to give to upcoming founders as they start as they build their own business having learned from your own experiences yeah three is a lot okay. <laughs> two one whatever <laughs> uh one is uh, uh i would say um, do not chase market sentiments uh what i realized is it's a long game that you play mm i used to think that in 3 to 4 years you'll have miracles coming your way <laughs> it doesn't happen that way it's a mm. long term commitment so the first thing that i would tell everyone is play the long game um and every single morning when you wake up that problem statement you're solving should actually give you so much of kick and excitement that you should mm. keep chasing keep for chasing. the next 10 20 years of your life then only value creation will happen uh so that's the first thing that i would tell uh, to everyone right yeah. do not chase market sentiment you have to play the long game uh pick something that you were really excited about um second thing i would um say is you know uh do not um you know fix the fundamentals first and do not get enamored by what people would tell you at various phases of your journey uh, so uh, solve by the first principles mm Uh, pick what is important to your company what is important to your product and solve accordingly um i think these two uh, broad advices i have third i would say pick a great team mm. you know a team that uh, i am very fortunate to be honest right uh, the people that we have we have who are building along with me i feel uh, very fortunate uh pure missionaries who feel that devotion should come online yeah and they are at it while i'm here they're <laughs> at it with the same rigor uh so the third part is team pick the team which plays the long game with you has the right fundamentals and heart in the right place and i think these three things uh and of course pick the right 
partners in terms of VCs and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, for me, I think one of the key learnings have been to um, solve for, I think, what we call it is uh, unknown unknowns first, right? You know, things that are very, very unknown to you, but could really make or break your business to start with, right? So solving for very, very heavy unknowns first, rather than, you know, doing things that are pretty much uh, done by hundreds of other people and then you know spending your time and energy uh, building that out right that, that's just replicating something that other people have already done so really really identifying what are some of the key unknowns for uh, whatever you're building to actually uh, exist or not right so uh, picking those out and focusing uh, very very uh, heads down on on that uh, in in uh, few early days is definitely one thing that i would want to uh, do second i think uh, as prashant rightly mentioned picking up a space that actually excites you yeah. to to yeah. wake Very up important. every morning Very important. and and, and uh, be at it right and there will be ups and downs while while you are at it yes. uh, and then at the times when when uh, things are not going well the only thing that actually keeps you going is your excitement for that space yep. right so that's definitely important third one uh, i think is picking along with the right team as prashant added uh, picking a right set of mentors to be around, right? Very true. Um, um, be it, you know, colleagues, uh, your parallels, uh, mentors from across the industry, different industries and whatnot, uh, from different spheres. But the idea is you should have a core circle of people that you can uh, um, talk to any yeah. time of the day that you want to. And whenever you have uh, a doubt, you can, you can, you know, pick up your phone and call them up to, you know, just brainstorm on things together, right? So that that's also very, very important. Got it. Excellent guys, I think you have given us a lot of food for thought here, both for, for us as well as for potential founders. I think we have been able to capture a lot more than what we hoped for. So really, really thank you so much for taking out time for this. I know it takes a lot. Each of us are, is keeping very, very busy to take out time for something like this and share your words of wisdom, share your insights. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Privilege to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, you. Yeah. thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. For more Matrix Moments episodes, you can head to www.matrixpartners.in slash matrixmoments. You can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube for more updates.